Oh Lord God, that is our heart, that is our desire. We long now that you would speak through your word. And we are here gathered collectively to sit under the authority, the truth, the clarity, the power, uh, the life giving nature of your proclamations, your declarations, your promises, your commands, your truths. We thank you, O oh God, that your word is in our language, that we can read it for ourselves, that we can hear it proclaimed to our own ears. These things are gifts from you. And we take them for granted too often, and even now we ask that you would help us by the power of your Holy Spirit to hear, to heed all that you would have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. It's my delight this morning to introduce a guest preacher. And if you were here for the Reformation Conference, you got to hear John Anderson speak yesterday. We're still basking in uh, what he taught us about missions and the church and expository preaching and the Reformation all intersecting in the life of John Calvin, and so John, we're so thankful for that. I'm glad to have him preach God's Word to you this morning. He is a pastor at Grace Emanuel Bible Church in Jupiter, Florida. He is the heart and brains behind the Ecclesia Conference on the Church that has been happening every September for the last near decade. He is a seminary professor in Greek and church history. He is a PhD candidate at Southern Seminary. Uh, he is Ashley Anderson's son, and uh, he's my brother-in-law. He let me marry his sister. And for all those things, I'm thankful. Uh, John, come up and preach the word to us. Well, now the secret's out about why I came to the uh, Reformation Conference and why the Reformation Conference happened. It was Smith's sneaky ploy to uh, get me back here with the family, and uh, you had to endure all of that for our enjoyment and family reunion this weekend. But uh, it is a genuine privilege to be here with you. I, I just want to say, first of all, greetings from Jupiter. Uh, I get, get to enjoy that one. And... Uh, I met somebody yesterday, and they said, oh, you look familiar. I said, yeah, did, did I meet you in Jupiter? And they just looked at me like, where did we get this guy? <laughs> but from our church in, uh, in Jupiter, Grace Emanuel Bible Church, I do want to just say greetings, and uh, it's a blessing to be here. Uh, you need to understand, uh, whenever I hear someone say, uh, hey, uh, John, do you know a place where I can worship, where I can learn the Word of God, where I can grow in... Um, Phoenix, or for that matter, Arizona, or for that matter, west of the Mississippi, I say, hey, how close are you to Grace Bible Church? It's just such a sweet um, connection to be able to know that you guys are here, ministering so faithfully, and uh, just upholding the Word of God. And I, I just count it a great privilege to uh, it because um, I just have respect um, this congregation, I respect the leaders here, and uh, just love what the Lord is doing in your midst. And so I need you to understand that because many of you have not met me, but uh, anyway, I, I recommend your church all the time whenever I hear somebody looking for a place to grow, and I know that they would grow here. And so because of the camaraderie we share in Christ, it's just um, even uh, apart from any lack of familiarity with, with any of you personally, uh, it is just such a privilege to be able to worship as family because I know that Christ is worshipped and adored and, and honored here. Um, I do, uh, I, do, I do need to say I'm a little disappointed that uh, Dad and Janet worship here because we had prayed in precatory prayers about you guys coming here, but uh, I think the five grandkids in Phoenix won out over the four grandkids in Florida, and so I was a little, a little disappointed and concerned about their hearts really spiritually that they made that decision. Um, we're praying for them, but... Uh, that's like a, that, that was a horrible way to start, though, because now, I've been, now everybody's animosity is going toward me because they love you, and uh, I'm about to open up the Word of God, and they're like, who is this guy? But no, it is a, a sweet thing. I just wanted, the last thing I wanted to say was just thank you so much for shepherding my family, my sister, brother-in-law, nieces, nephew, uh, father and stepmom, and they all worship here. So you, even if you have not met me, you need to understand the reason for my personal uh, love and appreciation for you is, is, is for all of those reasons. 
Well, we want to spend the rest of our time this morning looking at the Word of God, hearing from God. So grab your copy of the Scriptures and open up to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 to 19, and I don't get to say this often, but um, um, I actually get to preach an inspired sermon this morning, unless you think that's a really crazy uh, theological statement that I just flung out there. Um, Smed read Psalm 95, and I'm going to, I have the privilege of preaching an inspired sermon on Psalm 95, because it's not my own. It's an apostolic sermon, it's recorded for us in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 to 19. We're going to read this section together, and you'll notice in these first four verses, you're going to notice that he's quoting Psalm 95, particularly the second half of Psalm 95, and then in verses 12 to 19, he gives an exhortation from Psalm 95. So we really get to hear an apostolic sermon on Psalm 95. So let's read it together, starting in verse 7. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says... Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray in their heart, and they did not know my ways, as I swore in my wrath. They shall not enter my rest. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance Firm until the end, while it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. For who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Before we dive into this passage, let's pray. Ask the Lord's blessing on this time in the Word. Father, we've come here to hear your Word. We, we know that you are worshipped and glorified as your people gather You are worshipped and glorified as we sing your praises, as we worship you in song, as we minister to the needs of one another, as we prefer others more important than ourselves. But Lord, the, the, the pinnacle of our worship and the foundation of all of it, and the only safe place to evaluate our worship and our relationship to you is right here, in this very reality of what we just read, in the relationship of our heart to your word. Lord, we long that you would be worshipped as you deserve, that you would remain the exclusive object of worship in our hearts and in our minds, and we certainly cannot evaluate that this morning based upon emotion or how we feel. We cannot evaluate that based upon what upstanding members of the church might think of us. We cannot evaluate that based upon the amount of exposure we've had to your truth. Lord, we can only evaluate that based upon our hearts, softening or hardening to you when you speak. And here we we see in your word, we, we hear you in your word speaking, and so we ask for grace. Help us to soften. I pray that our hearts, that you would find them moldable, shapeable, that you would be able to conform them according to your will, according to your word, that you would mold and shape the inclination of our heart, the desires of our heart, and that wherever you speak and in whatever you say, our hearts would conform and, and shape to it. 
Lord, this morning, anywhere that you see and anywhere that you show us where our hearts don't conform, may we rise up in faith and point to our hearts as the liar and not your word. Wherever there's a confrontation between what you say and our minds and what you say and what we believe, grant humility, grant softness. May we believe you when you speak so that you might be worshipped this morning. In your name we pray, amen. I believe it was about a decade ago I read a book by Colin Hansen called The Young, Restless, and Reformed. And he was documenting what kind of became a, a, a movement over the next decade of a resurgence in evangelicalism of what would be called Reformed theology. And it's what we talked about this past weekend, a recovery, really, of doctrines that we, we know and love because they're taught in God's Word, namely doctrines such as the fact that man does not have the ability to save himself. A man who sins is a slave of sin, and salvation is a sheer act of God. It's, a, it's sovereign grace uh, I- intervening in a, in, a, in a sinner's life and transforming his life and granting faith and repentance. But this movement was, was documented by Colin Han- Hansen in such a way that I was, I was intrigued as he documented this, this influx, particularly among young evangelicals as they kind of glammed on in kind of a fanboy way to uh, notable Christian celebrities who happened to be reformed. And as he began to document this movement, as I began to watch this movement, what was curious to me was it seemed like the, the increase in conviction about these truths was not ultimately so much because young people were diving into God's word and seeing these truths on the pages of scripture. It was almost because it was trendy and because the men who they were glamming onto were such powerful and passionate preachers, they were served in possibly fleshly ways by joining up with this trend of Reformed theology. A true love of Reformed theology is not a trend. A true love of those doctrines are the bowing of the heart and mind to God who speaks clearly in his word. It's a preference for God to have his way in your heart than for me to feel a certain way when I hear some fantastic intellectual truth that I've never heard before. It makes me feel great. It could become intellectual candy. It could actually feed my flesh. And I watched the Young, Restless, and Reformed movement wondering if it would develop, if it would become full-born, if it would actually become a full Christian movement that embraced the Scripture, that embraced the church, Here's what I was concerned about as I saw this happening. I was hearing terminology like the recovery of justification by faith alone. And I will be the first to tell you, you cannot overemphasize justification by faith alone. But what you can do is emphasize it while at the same time downplaying other truths. Namely, how about sanctification by faith alone? How about actually believing the commands of the scripture and get after attacking your sin and putting it to death and obeying Christ because he's worthy of your worship when it doesn't really feel good to do that. But just because you prefer to worship Christ and he said to do that. And so I was concerned because of the imbalance and and I think what it produced was an approach to Christianity that really there was a, a fallout and we felt, the, we felt the full force of this down in, in southern Florida where I, for many months I was teaching a Bible study down south of us and the county south of us had a notable ministry uh, that was denying the truths of the obligation to actually obey the gospel. It just kind of had a truncated gospel of believing that, guess what, just believe that Christ died for your sins and then great, move on. And when it comes to actually living the Christian life, well, if, you're, if you actually think you have to obey the gospel well, that's just legalism. No, no, don't, you don't want to go down that road. Just keep living in your sin, but just keep acknowledging that it's wrong and see how much more glory Christ gets by your sin. We watch that lie, ruin families, ruin lives, deceive souls. And that imbalance is only answered by the balance of Scripture. And this morning, we're going to look at a passage of Scripture that 
it's a, it's a very sober text. And, you know, again, as I, like what text isn't sober? It's God speaking. But this is a very sober text when it comes to giving us balance to think about the Christian life, to think about our own relationship with Jesus Christ and what it means to relate to Jesus Christ. But one more quick comment by way of introduction. Before we dive into this passage, you, 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 you heard in this passage that our author is concerned about falling away. He mentions that. He's concerned about falling away, falling away from Christ. And that's a very real concern. If that's not a very real concern, then then something about your theology is preventing you from benefiting from a warning like this. Because falling away from Christ is a very real concern. It's also not incompatible with the promises of Christ to preserve his, his children. It's not incompatible, but if you, if, you, if you walk into a passage like this and your theology mitigates against a warning that's saying, I don't need to listen to that warning, I'm in Christ. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Listen to the warning. Benefit from the warning, because the warning is just as much from Christ as the promise is. And so, this has a personal implication. Um, for me, uh, I came to Christ in the midst of incredible um, concern about what it means to follow Christ, what it means to live a life with, with Christ and persevere. I had a friend and I met uh, well, that I knew in high school, and we used to pray together, and we would um, uh, meet together on Friday mornings before school and, and pray, and you know, he professed Christ, I professed Christ. I went off to school in Chicago, he went off to school in LA, and we met up a year later, I started asking him about how school was going, and I said, well, how, how's your walk with Christ? And he said, I, what are you talking about? That, that's just, that was bogus, John. And I proceeded to hear him describe how everything that he had believed and everything he had professed was a complete fraud, a complete lie, and now he knew that it's not true. And he was pursuing agnosticism with all of his heart and mind. Fast forward and about a year later, uh, I had a friend at school ask me, John, have you ever struggled with your assurance, assurance of salvation? How do you know that you're actually in Christ? And uh, I thought about it, and I was like, mm, no, I've never struggled with that whatsoever. And then the Lord started showing me who I was in his scripture, and he actually saved me, and I had presumed on some profession when I was a kid that I was a, a Christian. And so for the first time in my life, I began questioning, man, there's no way a guy like me could be, possibly be a Christian, because I'm a mess. <laughs> Look at what's going on in my heart. I got plugged into a church. I, I, I loved the truth. I loved Christ. I, I knew that I, I needed to grow, and, and I knew that if this was real, it was going to produce real change in my life. I could see that on the pages of Scripture. I get plugged into this church right there in Chicago. I came back from, my, from a summer break, and, and I, I walked back into that church my first Sunday. The assistant pastor gets up, and he says, well, keep praying for us and keep praying for the search committee as we are searching for a new pastor. Uh, as you know, pastor fill-in-the-blank disqualified himself, and so pray for us as we continue trying to find a replacement. And here I was, probably at that point six months in Christ, hearing he's disqualified from ministry, perhaps not even professing to be a Christian. I had never heard a man know the Bible so well or preach it so convincingly. And I was Hearing that, as a, as a brand new believer, thinking if that guy can't keep it together, there is no possible way I could make a normal length of life without disgracing Christ in incredible ways. For the next two months, I think I woke up every morning terrified. Lord, how in the world am I not going to dishonor you? Where is faithfulness going to come from? What's it going to look like to remain loyal to you? And so falling away from Christ uh, was a very, very significant concern of mine from the very beginning of my Christianity. This passage is extremely helpful. We are diving into the book of Hebrews, and there's a, a previous warning uh, that I won't, I won't look at, but you can look at it later. Just jot down chapters, chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, and, and read that this afternoon. And as you look at that first warning, the, the, the summary of that warning is, if, if, you, if, you, if you do nothing... If you just simply pay less close attention to the Bible, you'll fall away. So the warning there is don't neglect. What do you have to do to commit apostasy from Christ? Well, really, you just have to do nothing. Just don't really pay attention to the word, and you'll apostatize. In our passage this morning, 
it's, it's more of a subtle warning. It, it's a warning to those who are not just ignoring the Bible. It's now to those who are exposed to the Scripture, exposed to the Bible, but yet there is still a threat. In fact, it's an even more acute threat when you're exposed to the Bible because the question is, how does your heart respond? Hard-heartedness, listen, hard-heartedness is the path to apostasy. You don't have to distance yourself from the Bible. All you have to do is come up with sophisticated ways to justify not listening to the Bible. The question is, does your heart break and conform to the word? Does it soften? Does it believe every statement of fact? Does it heed every warning? Does it bank on every promise? Does it submit and obey to every command? That's the question for us this morning. So, as we started, we we saw that he's quoting Psalm 95, verses 7 through 11, quote that section of of Psalm 95, and as you remember that Smed read, in that psalm, he starts with this incredible expression of praise. Um, It's, it's, you might have been wondering, why, why is Smed reading Psalm 95? Well, because he knew I was going to be in Hebrews 3, so it was a, a great choice. But you, you think, that sounds like disjunction with what we just sang in that first song. But it's not disjunction. In fact, Psalm 95 it begins with that height of expression saying, praise God because of who he is. But then in the second half of Psalm 95, which our author quotes here, the psalmist, which is David, uh, as we find out in Hebrews 9, uh, 4, 9, In the second half of this song, David is actually saying that praise God because we are his. We are the sheep of his pasture. We are his people. And so he's actually praising God because we're his people. And then he gives this incredible warning. So as I give you this warning, you need to understand, first of all, Smed just said, hey, preach what you're preaching at your church. Uh, This is not some warning because I came here thinking, boy, you guys need to hear this warning. This is just where we happen to be. But I don't apologize for it at the same time because David gave this warning in an expression of worship and it's in an expression of worship to the people of God. This is not because of suspicion that they are not saved. In fact, the author of our epistle says he believes they are saved in Hebrews 6, 9. It's the fact that this warning actually will have its intended consequence in you who are his because your hearts will soften and you'll heed the warning. So here's the warning, verse 7. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness when your fathers tested me by trying me for 40 years. That is the warning. There's a historical background there. Obviously, besides Hebrews, uh, besides Psalm 95, David is appealing to the history of Israel. And let's look at that very briefly. We only have a few minutes here to do this. So turn to Exodus 17, and I want to show you the original story. It's probably familiar to you. It's called Massah and Meribah. That's the Hebrew words for testing and trial. As you're making your way to Exodus 17, I'm going to give you the big context here. So just think about this. Uh, The nation of Israel... They came out of Egypt, they saw incredible revelation, incredible truth, was dis- God's power was displayed through the ten plagues, through the, the deliverance, through the Red Sea, and then all the way through the wilderness, they continue to try God's patience. And by the time you get to Numbers 14, verse 22, Moses writes that these ten times you have put me to the test because you did not listen to me. You didn't listen to my voice. You see, with this generation that we're about to read about, there was not a lack of exposure to truth. There was not a lack of exposure to hearing God. The problem was they didn't soften. They weren't persuaded by it. They didn't believe it. They didn't obey it. So when he says in Numbers 14, 22, these 10 times, he's not exaggerating. That's not just kind of a throwaway word. Oh, these 10 times, yeah, it seems like like 10 times. I mean, it must be. It's literally 10 times. Just listen to this for a second. Stay stay in Exodus 17, but just listen to this catalog. Going back to Exodus 14, verses 10 through 12, they were complaining against God and against Moses that he brought them out of the Red Sea. After killing Pharaoh's army, they're complaining about being, being, well, they're they're complaining about being brought out of the nation, and they're pinned up against the Red Sea, saying, what are you, just going to kill us right here on the shore? God, God should have said, yeah, actually, on second thought, I think I will. 
why are you complaining against me? I told you, I'm going to deliver you. Number two, chapter 15, verse 22 to 24, now they're thirsty in the desert, and they're complaining. Hey, we're thirsty out here. And you can even see these, the context here. If you were wandering around in the desert, which is very vivid for us right here in Phoenix, for three days, you think, surely that circumstance justifies complaint. It didn't. They complained against God, which is a complaint against his character, which is a doubt of his promise that he's going to take care of them. It's a blasphemy against the character of God because they're, they're calling him a liar. This is very, very significant. Chapter 16, verses 1 through 3, the same thing happens with food. And God provides manna anyway. In chapter 16, verses 18 to 22, they disregarded Moses' instruction. They left the manna um, until the following day, and then it became foul with worms. And so God was angry, and, but he was patient. 27 to 30, um, they went out to gather on the Sabbath after he even told them not to. That was number five. Number six is the one we're going to look at. I'll pass on that for just a second. Number seven is Exodus 32, the entire chapter, the golden calf. God says, don't make an image. And they said, well, let's just make an image of the God who delivered us out of Egypt. And voila, this calf just somehow formed itself. Incredible. Numbers 11, this is number eight. They complained of adversity in the hearing of the Lord, and he struck down people in the, in the outskirts of the camp. Number nine, they were greedy for meat, so God provided quail, and then he provided a plague because he was so righteously indignant with their greed. And then in chapter 14 of Numbers, verse three, they complained against God, saying, give us another leader and take us back to Egypt. And so when he says these 10 times, he's not exaggerating. Let's look at Exodus 17. Verse 1, Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by stages from the wilderness of sin, according to the command of the Lord, and they camped at Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. So therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and they grumbled against Moses and said, why now have you brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with this people? A little more and they'll stone me. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pass before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb and you shall strike the rock and the water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he named the place Massah and Meribah because of the quarrel of the sons of Israel, because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? They tested God. They put God to the test. They questioned his character. You said you'd be with us. Now we're thirsty. Are you really with us or not? And I just, you can't help but read that and think, man, those, those punks. And at the same time, you can't help but read that and say, man, I'm a punk. My heart is so prone to complain against God when he's given me such clear testimony of his character and his promises. Do I believe what he says? Do I believe what he says about himself? Do I believe what he says about me? Do I believe his promises? Will I yield to the word when my emotions say, go the other way? Or will I justify my desires in the face of the text of Scripture? Watch out. Don't harden. Don't harden. Go back to Hebrews chapter 3. And now we're, we understand the text of Psalm 95, and now we get to look at what this apostle uh, gives us by way of inspired exhortation. Hebrews chapter 3 now, look at verse 12. After quoting that, he begins to develop the truths of Psalm 95, and he says, first of all, and what we're going to look at in verses 12 to 19, we're really just going to look at the remedies for hard-heartedness. And, and, by, and by the way, before we look at verse 12, let me just say this. I, I struggled with that. I thought, well, are these preventions of hard-heartedness? Or are they remedies for hard-heartedness? And there's a sense where it's both. 
But I ultimately went with remedies because the emphasis is on the tendency toward hardness that is resident within and the nature of the deceptiveness of sin. And so I think the, the better way to approach this is these are really remedies. Remedies. Remedies for hard-heartedness when we hear God speak. Verse 12, which is the first remedy. Verses 12 to 15 is corporate exhortation. Corporate exhortation. Here it is. Take care, brethren. Literally, watch out. Be on guard. Be vigilant. Be alert. Look out, brethren. It's a plural command. This is a command to Grace Bible Church as a congregation. A plural command for all of you to watch out. Watch out for what? Take care, be on guard, brethren, that there not be in any one among you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Wow. Watch out. Make sure that there's no evil, unbelieving heart that, that, that among you that falls away from the living God. And literally, that phrase there, that falls away from the living God, is a, it's a temporal phrase. It's just saying, you can even translate it, uh, take care that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart while falling away from the living God. The idea is apostasy happens while somebody is currently even in good standing in the congregation. In the midst of the assembly, somebody could actually be in the process of hearing God speak in his word, and an evil, unbelieving heart is not softening under that articulation of the word. And they are currently falling away from the living God. So the remedy here is corporate exhortation. Appreciate that for a moment. When, as you who are in Christ are hearing that warning and your heart is drawing you because you are aware of the danger, your heart is drawing you toward the church, saying, that's so true. That's so true. I need to be a part of the congregation. I want the assembling together to be the very means of encouragement and, and assault on any propensity of evil, indifference, neglect, or hardness within that would not actually buckle when the word of God is taught. I, I, I want that, and I want to be a part of that. I want other people to, to, to ask me, how am I doing? Am I softening under the word? And I want to be a part of that. Are, are you softening under the word as it's being taught? And this becomes a privilege. And for everyone in this room who's concerned about this warning, and you're experiencing the Spirit stirring you up by way of conviction right now, seeing the corporate element of verse 12 and 13, that's going to draw you to love the church, to say, oh, I'm so thankful for a church that's going to obey this and help me so that I don't fall away. Verse 13, but on the other hand, instead of falling away from a living God, on the other hand, encourage one another day after day as long as it is still called today. Now that sounds kind of funny, doesn't it? If I told you, encourage one another day after day as long as it's still called today, you think, well, that's some sort of like, you know, word game. Uh, you know, like I, I used to teach a Bible study right, right down the street from this, uh, you know, bar, and they'd had it on their marquee, you know, free beer tomorrow. <laughs> It's like, okay, yeah, good one, got it. Is that what he's saying here? Oh, no, you know, today, as long as you still call today. So tomorrow, if we're having this conversation, well, then tomorrow, we'll be calling tomorrow today. So yeah, it always works. That's, that's not what he's saying. This is not wordsmith. This is not a, a cheap pun. What he's doing is he's referring back to Psalm 95. What's today? Go back to Psalm 95. Well, just go back to chapter 3, verse 7. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden. As long as it is still called today, he's saying every opportunity, every time the word is preached, every time the word of God is opened, every time you read it, every time you hear it, that's today. As long as it is called today, as long as you keep hearing God speak in his inspired word, encourage one another, exhort one another. With this purpose in mind, look at verse 13. So that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Encourage one another so that you won't be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. 
Now, this is interesting because this purpose statement exposes really why this warning against hardness of heart is so challenging. It's hardness, of, hardness of heart is so challenging because sin is so deceitful. It's so deceptive. Um, in fact, I would, I would say, I, I would put it this way. In light of what he says in verses uh, 12 to 14, really, well, look at verse 14 for a second. I'm getting ahead of myself, but we'll come back to this. If we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance, firm until the end. If you hold fast to the boast of your confidence, which is Christ, firm until the end, you will persevere. You won't fall away. It's as simple as hanging on to Christ. But if it's that simple, if it's not complex, it's just very simple, why isn't it easy but hard? It is that simple, but it's, it's not easy. It's, it's, it's not easy because of verse 13, the deceitfulness of sin. How do you make sure that you hold fast to the confidence of your boast firm until the end? How do you do that? You make sure that you evaluate, how am I listening to the word of God? Listen, your relationship with Christ cannot be evaluated based upon the emotions you might happen to feel at any given moment of your experience of the journey with Christ. Your evaluation of your relationship with Christ Christ cannot be based upon what other Christians think of you. Your evaluation of your relationship with Christ can only be evaluated by this. Does your heart soften when he speaks? I've seen this in my experience in ministry. I've seen this over and over and over again. I've seen, it. I've seen the tendency in my own heart. I've seen it in, lived out in the lives of others. The downplaying of a warning like this, the justifying of desires, well, I have the Holy Spirit. I've got the Spirit living within me. So if my desires were supposed to be other, he could just change them. But as long as these desires are there, I'm going to act on them. I've heard that justification for sin. I've heard that justification for the pursuit of ministry, in spite of the fact that elders would not even affirm the calling or the character. I've heard that in romance. Guys who have that <laughs> conviction and yet the girl doesn't. <laughs> That's a problem. <laughs> you cannot evaluate your relationship by something that comes from within. This is the infallible testimony of what Christ is, who he is, and what he calls you to do. So your relationship to Christ must be evaluated by how well you listen. The uh, justification of sin is, we, we got to move, but I, do wanna, I, can't, I can't pass up this implication from verses 12 and 13. When we think about the corporate implication of this and how we need to be um, on guard for ourselves and for others around us, uh, there is a real, a real threat that comes by way of justifying any conformity to God's word by appealing to other areas of conformity. This is one of the greatest tactics of sin. Sin is so deceptive, it will lie to you by telling you, hey, you're okay over here because look at how well you obey in these categories. Meanwhile, we'll just ignore the glaring issue over here. I came across a, a quote from a theologian I was doing some work on, and a friend of mine sent me this. He knew I was reading on this guy, and, and um, not, a, not a good theologian by any stretch of the imagination. But uh, he was extremely popular, and he, he, had a hu he made a huge splash in Europe uh, in, the, in the 30s uh, because he was a brilliant theologian, and he started writing from the Scriptures. He, he knew the Word of God so well, and he knew theology so well that as he started to write these, these volumes, he was making a splash in Christianity because it seemed like he was totally dismantling all of the liberalism around him. And so everybody was saying, wow, this guy's the next best thing since sliced bread. And he wrote 16 volumes called The Church Dogmatics. And they made a huge splash in Christianity, and everybody said, man, this guy is, is the, the real deal. Well, this man 
was living a secret life. And it came out just recently that um, his family realized, you know what, we need to come clean. We have, we have the letters of, about his relationship with his, with his secretary. And, and you think about what I'm about to read to you. This man had a sophisticated justification to get around the glaring inconsistency between his life and the scripture because he pointed to the spiritual benefit of the compromise. The situation was he had a research secretary who actually helped him write the 16 volumes, and um, they were in love while he was actually married, and he actually moved his research secretary into his house so that he lived with both his wife and his secretary. And obviously your stomach is turning, just I haven't even read the quote yet. Let me read to you what he said about that relationship compared to his wife. He said, the way I am, I never could and still cannot deny either the reality of my marriage or the reality of my love. And you understand, those are two different things. It's true that I am married, that I'm a father and a grandfather. It's also true that I love. And it is true that these two facts don't match. This is why after some hesitation, at the beginning, we decided not to solve the problem with a separation on one or the other side. In another letter to another theologian, he said this. And listen to the justification happening here. It is precisely the fact which is the greatest earthly blessing given to me in my life, which at the same time is the strongest judgment against my earthly life. So he's saying the greatest blessing is this, this, this immoral, illicit relationship that he thinks is somehow promoting the gospel because of his notorious theological abilities while at the same time, that kind of looks really bad. How could you possibly even say such a thing? Here's how he says it. So I stand before the eyes of God without being able to escape from him in one way or the other. It might be possible that it is from here that an element of experience can be found in my theology, or to put it in a better way, an element of lived life. I have been forbidden. Listen to this. This is why he thinks it's so good. This is just disgusting. I have been forbidden in a very concrete manner to become the legalist that under different circumstances I might have become. You see what he's doing there? Here, my life looks like a mess. It seems like it's contradicted by the word of God. But because of this illicit relationship, it's actually prevented me from becoming a legalist. So it's a really good thing. Wow. 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 Sin is so deceptive. And you you read a story like that, and it turns your stomach, and you think, I don't even know how you get there. But guess what? You You don't wake up saying that after a habit of softening under the word of God on a daily basis. There's a trajectory, there's a path to apostasy that starts with a hardness of heart. So let me just be painfully transparent with you this morning and tell you a story about how I saw that in my own life about 10 years ago. My wife and I are having a conversation. We're talking about uh, the the, the tension that we were feeling trying to navigate our calendar and juggle schedules and and juggle priorities. And and my wife, April, she she just nailed the issue. We're sitting there having this discussion, and she said, okay, John, here's how I'm picturing this. And she pictured just, you know, this is... Hey, we're in Arizona. This is perfect. So picture a plateau, a little mesa where, you know, just flat on the top, steep on both sides, and here we are playing tug of war at the top, and we've got these two idols on either side. And you've got the idol of ministry and the idol of family. And so here we are playing tug of war. And as she's describing this scenario play out, I'm realizing she, is just, she just nailed it. Because what's happening is, as we're trying to figure out what the, how to prioritize our schedule, there was a little bit of tension in the discussion, and it was regularly a tension. It was becoming pretty problematic, because I realized that I'm sensing, it seems like she's pushing back against you know, meeting needs in the church and these ministry priorities, and she's thinking, man, it seems like he's pushing back against these needs in, with the boys and these needs in the family. And so here we are, justifying our idolatries by tugging against each other, trying to balance each other out by our idolatry. And she just nailed me. And I had to go just before the Lord. And I had to acknowledge, Lord, I am an idolater. I, I, was, I, was, in, I was going down a path of justifying negligence to my family by justifying it on the basis of fruit in ministry. 
That's the kind of justification, that's the kind of deceitfulness of sin that if it's not dealt with, would play itself out in this very scenario. So as I read that illustration of this theologian, I knew that's who I am by nature. Nothing but the grace of God to soften every time I hear the word spoken would prevent me from going down that path. Corporate exhortation. You need one another to point out the deceptiveness of sin in your hearts, in one another's hearts. So the answer to the question is, am I my brother's keeper? Is yes, you are. You are. Take care that when you hear his voice that you don't harden, so watch out. Make sure that there's no one among you. Plural command, corporate exhortation. We've got to move on. Number two, we'll be very brief here. Verse 14, he mentions perseverance Perseverance and assurance of salvation come from softening under the word. Notice what he says. We have become partakers in Christ. We have shared in Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. So first of all, notice partakers. We have become sharers of Christ. We have become partakers in him. We become united with him if we hold fast the beginning until the end. The condition is the second half of the verse. That's the condition of our currently being in Christ, is this holding fast. It's the clinging with a white knuckle grip to Christ. And what does that look like? Well, go back to verse 6. We didn't read it, but right before we started, he said this. Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are. In other words, we belong to the household of Christ on this condition. If we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. If we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope, firm until the end. How do you know if you're in Christ? If you hold fast. You never outgo Christ. You continue hanging on to Christ. Well, what does that look like? That looks like perpetually softening every time he speaks. So, the remedy for hard-heartedness is, here, is the assurance and the perseverance that you need come from that softening. So here we are, we're hearing a warning from Christ. Is your heart softening? Is your heart recognizing, I need this warning. I want this warning. God, help me heed this warning. This warning is beyond my ability. Sustain me, because I'm hearing you speak. That's perseverance that comes from softening. Third, the third remedy comes in verses 16 to 19. This will also be quick with, but notice verses 16 to 19. 16 to 19, just remember, what you need to understand here is that God is angry at unbelief. And that, that, come, that, sounds, very, that sounds very heavy. Like, how, wait, you're saying God's angry? That's going to that's gonna help me? Of course that's going to help you. This is absolutely going to help you. He's actually expositing Psalm 95 for us. So go back to the quote. In verse um, 10, he says, Therefore I was angry with this generation and said, They always go astray in their heart, and they did not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So he is very clear here. Divine wrath comes against unbelief, and that's appropriately so. So as we think about how our heart responds to the word of God, we need to sensitize ourselves here. And we need to ask, Lord, are, you're, you're slow to anger. You're, you're abounding in loving kindness. You're patient. But what righteously makes you angry when people don't listen to him? That's the whole point. Verse 16, who provoked him when they heard? Indeed, did not all those who come out of Egypt led by Moses? He reminds them of the wilderness generation, and he has the whole wilderness generation in, in front of them. And you think about that. You think of, of 600,000 males above the age of 20. You've got two, Joshua and Caleb, who actually made it. What in the world was the difference between the two and the 599,998? Wow, what was the difference? That should be in our mind when we read verse 16. And he says in verse 17, And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? Numbers 14, their corpses will fall in the wilderness because they sinned, they didn't believe. That's the difference. Joshua and Caleb, 
they were not naive, they were not ignorant. Remember, they went into the promised land, they saw it for 40 days, they come back, and, they, and the nation says, no way, we can't win. Joshua and Caleb say, of course we, we can't help but win. God promised it. Let's go. They believed. They were persuaded. They were ready to act on what God said. And the nation didn't. The nation doubted. The nation disbelieved. And so they go and they get worked. <laughs> they come back and say, let's try it again. And Moses says, don't go. God's not with you. They go back and fail. Joshua and Caleb believed. Verse 18, to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but those who were disobedient? And the word disobedient here means not persuaded. They weren't persuaded. And I'm going to close with a connection here between verse 18 and 19. But let me read verse 19. Uh, we're almost ready for it. Verse 19 concludes this section by saying, So we see. He summarizes it with the same word he started in verse 12. Take care. It's the same word. So we see. So there it was. See or look. Look out. Now we do see. that They were not able to enter because of unbelief. Notice the connection in verse 18 and verse 19. Why didn't they enter? What prevented them from entering? What caused God to be angry? Verse 18 says they weren't persuaded. Verse 19 says they didn't believe. Let's look at this for a second. This word, those who were unpersuaded, uh, if we had a noun, it would be unpersuasion, which, which actually isn't a word, but it should be a word, just for texts like this. Uh, unpersuasion. The reason why I want to say that is because sometimes this word for persuasion actually does emphasize the fruit of being unpersuaded, which would be disobedience. So sometimes you'll see it translated disobedience. But here it's talking about the heart. Remember the whole warning? Watch out to your heart. Look out in your heart what is happening as you hear God speak? See, long before we get to the acts of apostasy that are visible in notorious and egregious ways is what's happening in the heart as you hear God speak. And if the heart is not persuaded, it won't obey. So he can actually say that the disobedience of verse 18 is equivalent to unbelief. You kind of expect in verse 19 for him to say, so we see they weren't able to enter because of disobedience. No, because of unbelief. Heart wasn't persuaded by what God said, so it doesn't act on it. I mean, that's obvious. I remember hearing the story about uh, the international terminal at LAX being shut down because a gunman entered the terminal and started opening fire. And so the police barricaded off, prevented any passengers from entering. Now, if you were thinking, this is some sort of joke, this is a movie set, they're just filming this thing, I gotta catch a flight. <laughs> I'm not about to miss this flight. You'd blow it off and you'd run in there. But if you actually believe, no, they're serious. Like, I, I believe you. There's no way you're gonna go in there. Bullets are flying. Like, no, that's not worth it. If you believe it, if your heart is persuaded, you act on it. That's the issue. Jesus made that very point. And let's end with the words of Jesus. Look at John chapter 3. John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 36. And you can see this, this incredible connection between persuasion or belief and obedience. Which then also proves the same point of the connection between unpersuasion, our made up word, or unbelief and disobedience. Look at John 3.36. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not believe... Did you see it? But he who does not obey the Son will not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. See, Jesus makes a perfect corollary between belief and disobedience. And God is rightly provoked that's such a heart response. Because what is happening in the heart response? When you hear God speak, even if you find a sophisticated way to excuse the obligation that's on your life to respond in faith, you are calling God a liar. I've, had, I've seen this in my heart a million times, and I have to get to the point where I'm pointing the finger at myself saying, John, you are the liar. Let God be true and every man a liar. If there's an inconsistency between what God said infallibly and what I feel in my heart, I'm the liar. God is true. I'm the liar. God is true. So here's the way you want, I want you to picture it. 
as you're hearing God speak, every time the word of God is opened, every time it's preached, every time you hear a sermon download, uh, whenever you're hearing, today, if you hear his voice, the test is on. Where are you going to sign your name? John 3.33 says, He who believes in the testimony that I made of the Son, he signs his name, that God is true. So there's the contract over here. God is true. Do I sign my name on that line? Right there, yep. I just heard what he said. I'm indicted. God is true. I'm signing my name. John, you're a mess. Over here, here's another contract. 1 John 5.10. John writes, He who does not believe in the testimony of the Son believes that God is a liar. So here's the contract. God's a liar. And I'm signing my name there. Wow. Wow, is that truth, as blunt as that is, that is truth. That is ever so helpful as I try to shepherd my own heart as I hear the word spoken. Today, if you hear him speak, where are you signing your name on the dotted line? God's a liar or God's true? That's the test. And as we benefit from that lesson, that prevents us from going down the path of hard-heartedness that leads to apostasy. Can I just tell you, brothers and sisters in Christ, if God is that zealous and righteously indignant against unbelief, how passionate is he toward you who believe? How pa- if he's that committed to bringing, uh, keeping unbelievers out of the promise, how passionate is he about getting you who believe into the promise? The, the, the warning, and as severe as that is, is equally encouraging for you who believe. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we're so thankful for this warning. It is um, a very sober and heavy warning. And Lord, we know that you, you make no mistake in your word because, Lord, our hearts needed to hear this. Our hearts are an incredibly, by nature, incredibly hard, and by your grace they are softened. And by your grace alone are they softened. And so, Lord, we thank you for the promise that you will keep those who are your own, but we also know that we cannot presume on a warning like this and think that, well, surely... We're in you, so we don't have to listen. No, the only safe place to be is to trust in your promise that you will preserve us as we respond to your warning. And Lord, we know that you will give grace to the humble. We humble our hearts under this warning and we acknowledge, Lord, that we must constantly be, on, be vigilant, and not only for our own hearts, but also for others. And we, we know that the very ground of our assurance is the continuing softness and and brokenness and humility of our hearts under your word. And we know that the urgency of this warning is fueled by a, a realization of how rightly angry you are at unbelief. And so, Lord... Thank you for that warning. We, we, we love what you love. We hate what you hate. And so as a result, we, we bask in the softness that you've produced in our hearts and we hate the remaining hardness of heart. And so for all of your children in this room uh, who, are, who are hearing this message and, and perhaps some are even burdened by the weight of concern, even refresh them by the fact that they're experiencing that weight of concern. That's the Holy Spirit. And now the test is on to believe you to heed your warning and we know that your grace is sufficient to respond to such a warning so that we would not be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin and Lord for anyone here who this morning who, who does not know you and perhaps they heard this warning and they thought this is absurd that people would believe this and they're, they're already discarding your warning and they're already proving that there's hardness reigning in their hearts because they have no desire to even heed the warning I pray by your grace sovereignly intervene. I pray that even now you would show them a perspective of themselves through your word that that you have. Show them how they appear to you in your eyes so that they would see their need for Christ and their need for softness. Lord, as we um, finish this service, as we sing your praise, and as we have opportunity to encourage one another in fellowship throughout the rest of this day, Lord, we thank you for the privilege of worshiping in congregation where there is a body who will be a blessing to each and every one of us. And I pray in like kind that we would be a blessing to those around us. So in the conversation coming up, may we serve one another. May we meet the needs that exist in the body as we consider others more important than ourselves. In your name we pray. Amen.